Oh, I was always interested in history, actually. I, I, um, when I was in college, I actually started in sociology or history, history and sociology as my major. And I actually switched to sort of hard sciences in my third year because I sort of realized I also was interested in, in those things. But I was actually always interested in history as well. And when I moved into sort of hard science and into biology, I kind of left that history behind, but I sort of rediscovered it uh, in graduate school. So uh, what happened was I was looking for a laboratory to work in, in statistical genetics or statistics or math or physics or something like that or biology. And I was wandering around laboratories and there was one laboratory that was doing uh, human history as learned from genetic data, which I never heard about before and didn't know that you could actually do. But I was sort of interested in history and I actually wasn't even really in a PhD program yet. So I thought this will be something fun to do for a couple of years and actually turned into what I continue to do now. Yeah, so the best piece of advice I ever received um, was probably uh, the same piece of advice I got from my advisor at the time and also from my mother, uh, which was I had an amazing result, which was that um, after human and chimpanzees separated, chimpanzees are our most close, cl our closest living relatives, there was then um, a hybridization between gorilla and uh, human ancestors that led to our lineage today. So that was very exciting and interesting result, and we had strong um, genetic statistical evidence for it. Um, and so I said to, I presented a paper that was nearly finished to uh, my advisor and I said, what do you think of this? And he said, wow, that's amazing. Um, I think, I'm pretty convinced you're right. It's, you know, I would bet that you're right, but it would be such a career wrecker if you published this um, result and it turned out to be wrong that you should check it some more. This is the same thing my mom told me. So I then went ahead and checked it some more, gathered more data. It turned out to be wrong, just a statistical fluctuation. So ever since, I've actually gathered much, much more genetic data and tried to be as, as convinced as possible and to address thing with things with multiple lines of evidence. So you find one pattern, but then you actually look for other patterns that would be predicted by that model. This is what we did with, for example, the evidence of um, gene flow between Neanderthals and the ancestors of non-Africans. We actually supported it with multiple lines of evidence, and it's in part at least my contribution to that um, uh, due to this sort of um, advice that I got and this sort of shock that I got that things actually might seem one way, but they're actually are not always the way they at first seem. Uh, I was actually really interested in maps, um, and so we had a map of the world next to our uh, dinner table, breakfast table, and um, I was interested in um, projections and distortions in maps, and so um, I um, uh, um, was sort of thinking about ways, so you, you know, in a map you sort of have distorted sections of the globe depending on where the map is trying to get it best, uh, get the best picture. And so what sort of I developed is this sort of map where I sort of wrote, I drew the map of the world by hand on these little strips and I could move the strips around to undistort any place I wanted to. So that was my sort of first scientific experiment and I sort of spent a lot of time drawing maps of the world and sliding little um, pieces of cardboard around to undistort and distort different sections. I think it's the really freedom to sort of um, ask uh, questions that uh, you or other people don't really know about. So it's to really sort of figure out something that's never been known before. Um, and um, certainly in the area that I work in, there's lots and lots of things that we don't know. And we have so much more ability to learn about them than we used to even five years ago because the amount of, of information we have access to from ge genome sequencing is so much larger. And so it's really like being a sort of a child in a candy store or something like this because there's so many unanswered questions and the data are finally in place to really answer them. And so we could all answer these questions about human history and how people relate to each other that we really couldn't answer before and really areas that have been really struggled with before by other fields like archaeology or fossil science. We can't answer all the questions they struggled with, but some of them we can answer now with these genetic information. I think the thing that you really want to do is to always ask yourself, whenever you hear something like on TV or on the radio or in a newspaper article, always think like, why is that wrong? Or how could that be wrong? And to always be questioning what you, what you hear or, you know, is there something else that's going on here? So I think that that's what you always have to cultivate. And I think that sort of the best scientists I know are always sort of thinking in a little bit of a contradictory way when people talk to them. What, what's wrong about that?
I think there's uh, lots of different uh, areas where my particular research uh, sort of adds value to sort of as a social benefit. I think a lot of other people's research also has a social benefit. Part of my research uh, is medical, um, and so there's a direct uh, impact on, on finding genes that cause disease. I study mixture between human populations, and a lot of human populations, like Latinos and African Americans and South Asians, are mixed populations, and you need to understand that history of mixture in order to find the genes that affect risk for disease in those populations. But the other thing is really pushing pushing knowledge forward and answering things that we didn't know about before. And I actually think that that's sort of one of the most important things that as a society we do, which is we have a group of people, um, uh, preferably lots and lots of people, who are really asking about fundamental things like the nature of, 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 of the universe and the nature of our biology and the nature of our history and that we didn't really know before. And so we get to ask these questions that we really didn't know about before and address them. And I think that's very valuable. I think probably the person who's been most influential to me, I've had a few very important role models, but um, I think that probably the person who's been most uh, influential in me is not someone I've really met. Um, well, I actually haven't met him two years ago, but someone named Luca Cavalli Sforza. So Luca Cavalli Sforza is sort of the person who really started this field of population uh, learning about history from population uh, variation, for genetic variation. And he's an Italian researcher. He spent most of his life in the United States, his working, his research life. Um, uh, but he's really a, a great scientist. But I've had other really important influences. For example, my main collaborator is a statistician, Nick Patterson, uh, who I work with all the time. And this is his third career. He was a cryptographer. He broke codes for the US and the British governments. Um, and he was a hedge fund uh, scientist. Um, and he really loves um, thinking about data trying to get to the bottom of things, and that's been a great influence on me. So I, I think that what's very interesting about the field is really um, how much power we have to look about, learn about things that we didn't know about before. There's big questions about the nature of human history. Um, uh, what is the, how, how do the people who currently exist now, how did we get here, and things that we assume are true that actually turn out not to be true, and you could see those in the genetic data. And so, for example, people often think that Europeans are a homogeneous group that's arrived in a simple way there maybe 40 or 50,000 years ago based on the archaeology and just kind of sat there until they became the Europeans they are today. But that's probably not true. The Europeans today are a replacement population who came in much more recently and replaced the people who there, were there originally 40,000 years ago. People in Africa are certainly very diverse, but in fact there's very deep strands of variation in Africa. And for example, West Africans, people, uh, the primary ancestral group of African Americans today are actually turn out to be mixtures of very differently uh, diverged groups. Um, that go very deep in time. And so this is all very interesting. Uh, also true for East Asians. East Asians, people in China today, are not the same people who were there for the first time 40,000 years ago. In fact, they're a replacement population, largely, that arrived there after the first people there. So you see this history of more complex population movements than people think at first. I think the disk with all my data sets I think that's what we need. That's an interesting question. I, I actually like to uh, work in a cafe sometimes, and it's been a theme of my whole life working in loud cafes with kind of pop music going on. I never know what they're playing, but I kind of know all the current pop music, even though I don't know the I don't know the uh, don't know the artists, but like, uh, so I like loud uh, kind of pop bad music all the time playing in the background. It sort of makes me able to concentrate, helps me concentrate.